I'm Allison Gilchrist, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Science Fest. And I'm Grayson Wheeler, and we're here to talk to Dr. Arjun Raj, who is an Associate Professor in the Department of Bioengineering at the University of Pennsylvania. So, hey. Hi, pleasure to be here. Yeah, pleasure to have you. So, uh, do you want to tell us um, a little bit about what your lab does and what you're most interested in? Yeah, so um, so my lab is really interested in uh, quantitative biology, I suppose, at a very high level. Um, and more specifically, we're very interested in the biology of single cells. So rather than kind of grinding together large numbers of cells and finding out their average behavior, uh, one of the things that we're very interested in is seeing are there special outlier cells within an otherwise homogenous seeming population and potentially those cells might do something very different than uh, than all the other cells uh, in in the mix and that could have important biological consequences or or so we hope and um, that's our jam so Sweet. yeah and you're giving a talk here about cancer cells and free will right Next yes time. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so one of the areas that we're very interested in uh, lately is uh, looking at this question of, you know, do individual cells do something different than all the rest of them in the context of uh, cancer biology. So cancer is a disease in which there are many single cell problems. So the onset of cancer is uh, typically thought to occur in one cell that then gives rise to all the tumors. Um, actually, there's another problem with single cells that we're very interested in, which is uh, if you add an anti-cancer drug, you end up killing off most of the cells, but not all of the cells. And of those few cells that remain, like what was different about those cells that allowed them to live, uh, whereas all the other ones died? And that would be good to know because if we could figure out what's different about those cells, potentially we could get rid of them and make our anti-cancer drugs that much more powerful because even if they kill off 99.99% of the cells, that those few that remain, if they keep dividing, will end up repopulating uh, the tumors and giving you disease relapse. So, uh, so that's one of the things we're very interested in lately. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I study too. Um, <laughs> I, so I was super interested in your talk already. Um, where does free will come into yeah, it? So, yeah, I speak yeah, here. I mean, it's, um, tell us not to anthropomorphize. When I give talks, I always get told not to anthropomorphize cancer cells. Like, not to treat them like they're people making yes. decisions. Exactly. So, I mean, I kind of throw it in there because it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the idea is, so I, I think when, uh, when I say free will, I mean it in a very operational sense. So, um, I think we're very used to thinking about genetic determinism these days. It's like the era of, you know, our genes define us. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think a lot of uh, cancer biology has been dictated by this thinking, like a genetic determinism, if you will. So the reason why my cell does X is because I have mutation A. Uh, and the reason why my cell does Y is because I have mutation B. And what we were asking the question is like, okay, well, if these cells, maybe even if they're genetically identical, so there's really no difference at the genetic level, do they still have what looks like free will in the sense that can they, you know, 99 of them turn left, but one of them decides to turn right. Uh, and you could think of that as free will. I mean, I prefer a very operational definition, um, meaning that is there something I can measure about this cell that tells me whether it's going to move left or right? Mm -hmm. So if there's nothing I can measure about the cell that tells me which direction it's going to go, then I, or, then I would say that's like equivalent to free will. Like I have no idea what the cell is going to do. It's just going to make its own you know, free choice. Um, on the other hand, if I could measure, let's say, all the, the DNA in the cell and I could say, okay, well, I know it has this mutation and so that makes it go left to right, uh, then that would be an example of genetic determinism. So what we're very interested in is actually non-genetic determinism. So are there other things about a cell that we can measure that tell us whether it would turn left to right, but they're not necessarily the genes? Uh, so in our case, we think it's more related to the activity of the genes, but not necessarily the, 
genetic makeup of the genes, if, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it seems um, like a like a lot of people who don't um, are a lot of people who aren't as deep into genetics might see that as equivalent as measuring the genes and measuring the activity of the gene. Right. So there's a big operation, like sort of functional difference. Um, and that is that if once you get a mutation in a cell, like if you, uh, if you mutate the gene, then that cell is kind of stuck with that mutation forever, or at least for a very long time. Whereas these uh, changes in gene activity, actually what we found is that they fluctuate quite rapidly. Within many days, the cell will sort of move into one state and then move out of that state into another state. So they could be resistant to drug one day and then not resistant to drug the next day. Uh, and that feature of being able to move back and forth, um, we think is really important because uh, therapeutically what that suggests is that there's a biological process that pushes cells to be drug resistant and then pushes them back. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that we could actually potentially target those processes to maybe make less of those cells or more of those cells or whatever we wanted to do. Whereas mutations, they just happen and you're stuck with them. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you could have a biological process that pushes cells in or out of these states, um, I think it's, uh, conceptually distinct in that regard. And that I think allows us a lot of therapeutic potential as well. What other things can you study that might make a difference in these decisions that cells are making, but beyond like the activity of genes? Are there, is there anything else that could be important in that decision? Um, there could be a lot of different things. So one of the big questions is how much of this is intrinsically determined by the cell and how much of it is extrinsically instructed to the cell. So um, do cells just, you know, seemingly randomly decide to become, to, you know, move into the drug resistance state or not, or, you know, do they randomly fluctuate? Or is it that this cell at this place in space and time is instructed by its environment to move into this state or not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we think the evidence suggests some mix of the two of these. Um, and we don't know at this point what the relative contribution is of the two. So that's a really important, I think, area for future, uh, future research is to determine how much, is, how much does the cell do something by itself versus just told what to do by, you know, its circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm trying to think of things that aren't too overly technical. I don't know. So you have to deal with a ton of data probably, right? If you're looking at, uh, if you're measuring genes in single cells like that, um, that is too technical. I was going to say, how do you handle all of that? But, <laughs> well, there's a lot of like big data kind of questions. I mean, yeah. and actually, I mean, I got a lot of thoughts on big data, so we can talk about that if you want. Yeah, yeah that'd be lovely. What, what is, is your data? Is it measured? Um, is it like image data or what kind of data do you mostly collect? Yeah, so we collect a mix of sequencing data and imaging data. And I would say that... Um, one of the things that's been really fun to play with in the last couple of years in the lab is that I think uh, we've been able to combine these sorts of data in interesting ways. So, you know, there are a lot, I would say most of our projects combine imaging and sequencing um, to some extent. And I think that having these different kinds of, you know, big data coming in, are really allowing us to ask questions that would be very difficult to, to answer otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, that said, actually, it's very interesting because I feel like these days, everybody's talking about big data and a lot of biology is turned into essentially a, a data gathering um, exercises, in particular in the single cell field, I think as, as you're sort of alluding to that, um, in the single cell field, you collect vast amounts of data now on each of the cells and collect you know, millions of cells, uh, sort of a wash in data. Um, I actually think it leads to an interesting opportunity uh, to 
maybe take a step back from the data, from this data deluge, and ask questions about you know, what, what are we going to learn from all this data? Um, it's interesting because I've been working in this field for now a sort of depressingly long time. Um, in the early days, we had a lot of conceptual questions about things like, you know, this sort of like cellular free will or, uh, you know, to what extent are cells different? What does it matter whether they're different? How, how, what are the ramifications? And we didn't have the same tools that we have today, but at the same time, um, now we have all these tools, but people have forgotten, it seems, some of the questions that we had to begin with. Uh, so one of the things that I've found interesting in the lab these days is that um, we're kind of taking tools that other people have developed and trying to use them to answer some of these questions that people posed, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And I think now we actually have some of the tools to, to really make some headway on those problems. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a, a specific example of a question that was asked a long time ago, but we didn't know how to answer it and that you're trying to address next? Um, yeah, I can even give that in sort of general terms. So I think one of the main questions that people had was um, people had noticed that if you look at individual cells, they look different from each other. And on some level, maybe that's unsurprising. I mean, what are the chances that two cells are exactly the same? I mean, they're always going to be different in some way, shape, or form. Even if you take identical twins, if you look closely enough, there are some differences. Mm -hmm. The big question is, do any of those differences matter? So, you know, like, oh, you know, the one identical twin, their fingerprints are different than the other identical twin, like, Okay, who cares? You know, does it really matter? Um, and <laughs> what's that? It does if you're fighting crime. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's very important. That, but, um, yeah, so you know, actually, this question of functional differences, by the way, I think is very much dependent on the question you, you ask. So I think what you're saying is actually very true, even in the context of cells. That you know, um, they're only different in the ways that we can ask and. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting guiding principle. But anyway, um, so yeah, I would say that for the longest time, we had a really hard time connecting. There, there are isolated examples, but connecting this cellular variability with actual biological behaviors was really difficult. And I think part of the reason was that uh, most of the biological, single cell biological behaviors that I think are really important happen in rare cells. Uh, and oftentimes people sort of confuse that with mutations because mutations are rare. So they figure, well, if you have a rare cell that does something different, it must be a mutation. I think now we have the tools to measure enough cells to actually profile enough cells that we could even look at uh, rare behaviors at the single cell level and actually get enough data to be like, oh, well, it's just some, instead of saying, oh, that's just some weird data point, now we can say, no, we're systematically seeing uh, these differences in rare cells, mm -hmm. and they have important biological consequences. So, uh, so that's one that we've directly um, been very interested in, in addressing, and I, I think there are others like that, too. Yeah. I, this is kind of a gear-switching question. But a lot of people here are super, super, super excited for this talk. Like I had people ask me if they could sit in on this interview, which I said no, because I was already nervous about it. <laughs> um, but I think a lot of it is because you do really, really cool science. But I think people are really aware of your cool science because you're active on Twitter. Um, your lab also is really, like a couple of members of your lab are pretty present on Twitter. And that's really cool. I was wondering like... The ubiquitous Caroline Bartman, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so uh, I just think it's really cool that you make time for that. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about why you do. Yeah, it's actually really interesting. So I would say, uh, geez, it must have started a couple of years in. Um, I just always had this desire to write up some thoughts that I had about science. Um, and then a couple of years into my faculty position, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to write a blog. Uh, why not? You know, just write some thoughts and post it up there and maybe someone will read it or not. And, uh, and so just started writing just for the fun of it. And 
that was really satisfying and a lot of fun. Uh, I think especially because in science, our writing all feels so stilted most of the time. Like it's all going to be so technically precise and you get it reviewed or whatever. I mean, with the blog, it's just like, you just hit publish. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's out there, you know what I mean? Um, you definitely get like post-publication peer review on it. I'll tell you that much, but uh, <laughs> at least you can kind of get it out there quickly. And it was just, it was a fun thing to do. Um, and then I, I was like, what is this Twitter thing? And then I noticed that um, some number of people were tweeting about blog posts and things. So I went on Twitter and I was like, oh, wow, there's an interesting community of people here. Uh, in the beginning, I think it was very computationally skewed. But now I would say, you know, I'm kind of amazed at pretty much a very large fraction of scientists that I know, even established scientists, are on Twitter, use it um, either to promote their, many just sort of promote their papers and that's fine. Uh, but some actually in, engage in a lot of discussions and I think it's a lot of fun. I, in fact, some of the things I've found most useful is like, you know, we'll be like, oh, how could we like five prime label these oligos? And you just put the question out there and the hive mind will come up with 10 different protocols for you. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. Um, in fact, this one time we even lost uh, a little cryo box in the bottom of our liquid nitrogen. Um, we lost yes. you. Yeah. Do you want uh, to, this one time we... <laughs> oh, okay, I can go back. So this one time we, uh, we lost this cryo box in the bottom of our liquid nitrogen and it was kind of stuck down there. I was like, oh, no. get this thing out. So I posted it on Twitter. <laughs> and uh, of all people, Corey Bartman wrote back and said, oh, you need the gripper. <laughs> Part number. <laughs> We use like a strainer, like a, the kind of thing that you would like oh, run like, yeah, yeah. like a colander basically <laughs> to like scoop stuff out of there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, this was like way down in the bottom. So actually we did some weird thing with a coat hanger and somehow got it out. But, <laughs> but it was fun, you know, it was like little life science life hacks on Twitter. So Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's evolved into something that I think is very interesting. I mean, I would say there's, uh, there's a lot of scientific discussion. One of the things that I think I sort of dislike about it is that it's sort of very, sometimes a little like moralistic, if you will. And I think there's this, um, you know, I didn't really grow up in this era of social media so much, but I believe there's this idea that everyone sort of puts on their Facebook face or something, which is your sort of public persona. And uh, one of the things that I've found, so, you know, I worry that it causes anxiety amongst people. Like, am I being the most perfect science person, you know, ever? Am I accomplishing the most amount of work in exactly 40 hours a week? And do I have hobbies and do I have this and that? <laughs> you know, I think it causes a lot of anxiety for people. And I guess the one thing that I can say is that, you know, some of the people who I know personally, um, <laughs> I can say that all of their sort of moral grandstanding on Twitter uh, sort of masks a reality that's far more complicated for them uh, than, you know, where people make decisions in their life, good or bad or whatever, and uh, just don't sweat it. Don't take it too seriously what's on there. Yeah, that's a good reminder that social mm -hmm. media doesn't have to be the life that you lead in real life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, it like tends towards that. I mean, you know, people always agree with sort of obviously true things that seem good so those messages get amplified so i don't know yeah interesting yeah um and your lab blog do you we looked at it very briefly and mm -hmm. we were wondering you know um is it something that you use in lab as a teaching tool do your students write for it do you know who's reading it outside of your lab and um i think the readership is actually pretty wide uh, especially after I started posting them on Twitter, you know, a lot of people would read them, um, which is really cool and gratifying. Uh, although, you know, I have to say, I haven't written a post in a while. It's been <laughs> a day job gets in the way, you know, uh, but I have several half written posts. <laughs> um, yeah. So initially it was actually intended to be a lab blog for everyone in lab to post. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple of other people in lab have posted. I think Caroline has a couple of posts. Mm -hmm. um, 
and uh, yeah, maybe I just have the most time on my hands because <laughs> I do so many experiments. So, uh, yeah, but it's um, it was always intended to be sort of a lab blog, and I think it's proven to be a really nice outreach tool. I think a lot of people. Uh, come at many times I would go give a talk and afterwards someone would come up and say, Oh yeah, I really like that blog post or, or I really disagree with that blog post. That <laughs> do you recommend that other PIs do it? Um, I think it's a very particular phenotype that would enjoy writing a blog. So I think you have to on some level enjoy writing Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise it's just, it's just, there is so much writing in this job already that if you don't like it, <laughs> it's just like, why am I going to add this extra headache to, on top of everything else? So I would only encourage blogging for people who really have some desire to write, or you really feel like you have something to say and, uh, and the time to say it, because I, I would definitely not advocate that everyone should write a blog and definitely have to do it and, and so forth. Um, I think it's wonderful if it's a thing that you like to do, but it's, you know, it's time and writing and it's not for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about your um, Boulder connection. <laughs> right. So uh, when I graduated from high school and went to college, so uh, that summer, the summer before I went to college, my parents actually moved. I grew up in Ithaca, New York, upstate New York, mm -hmm. and they moved to Boulder right then. So we actually, I think we drove from Ithaca to Boulder. Uh, my dad really loves long distance driving. And uh, yeah, I was there for like a couple of weeks and then I went to college. <laughs> so, um, so, but yeah, my parents still live there uh, and they live on, on the hill. And your talk. Yeah, they're coming to my talk, and uh, my brother and sister both grew up in Boulder. In fact, my sister's moved back, so uh, she and her boyfriend and, and their dogs live in Boulder. Um, and so they'll be coming to the talk, too. <laughs> and I think my brother's randomly in town also, so it's going to be like a whole family. Is it making you nervous to have so much family there? What's that? Does it make you nervous at all to have family there? So much family there? <laughs> um... Only if they ask questions. <laughs> Otherwise, it should be all right. <laughs> just not call on them. <laughs> just be like, yeah, I, you know, that's a really good idea. I'll be like, huh, anyone else? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it would make me very nervous if my mom was in the audience. I, like, weirdly, every time I go home, make my family watch talks that I've given. <laughs> like, I think oh, wow. Nice. You are a very uh, courageous person. <laughs> I just want to say, oh, they're very nice. <laughs> so I want them to be like, wow. <laughs> well, it's, my dad is a scientist. Oh, um, nice. He does okay. material science. Cool. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what, what he thinks about the whole thing. So. Is he affiliated with the university? Um, yeah, he's a professor in mechanical engineering. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so, so much for letting yeah, us know. Absolutely. Yeah. This was so much fun. Yeah. yeah. It was really nice to meet you. And we're yeah, great to meet you guys too. And I guess I'll see you in about like a week or something, huh? Yeah. Yeah. yeah we'll come up great. and introduce ourselves. <laughs> I'm live tweeting your talk, so. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs>